Hi, my name is Teresa Duncan, and today I'll be presenting Connecting the Parts from Gerald Graff's book, They Say, I Say, Chapter 8, pages 104 through 114. This chapter is concerning connecting the parts of your sentence so your reader can understand um, what you're talking about. Graf opens chapter eight by recounting a teaching experience with a student named Bill. Bill was the student who um, would not or could not connect his sentences. He uh, typically used parts of sentences that didn't really define or make sense to the reader. Graphic ex uh, provides examples to us and to Bill of what to do and not to do when writing sentences without transition words. Uh, Bill wrote, for example, Spot is a good dog. He has fleas. And in the paper that Bill was composing, Graf uh, responded to him, what in the heck does Spot having fleas have to do with him being a good dog? As you can see, it's kind of a disjointed thought process, and it makes it harder for our readers to understand what we're talking about. So uh, to encourage the student to relinquish his bad habit, Graf offered these correct suggestions that include transition words. Spot is a good dog, but he has fleas. Spot is a good dog, even though he has fleas makes more sense than Spot is a good dog, he has fleas. The transition words that were included in the sentence, but and even though, we'll talk about those a little more. Because it was a shameless opportunity to put a, a video of my own dog in his monster hat uh, in this presentation, uh, I also provided my own example Miller is a good dog because he doesn't have fleas. We don't do fleas in this house. So, yet, yeah, why does that make sense? We're going to find out. Uh, there are some tips provided um, by Graf, and they say, I say, chapter eight, uh, about using transition words. Transition words can be employed to move smoothly from one topic to another in a sentence. Here are our uh, four types of transition words. Additive transitions introduce new information or examples. Adversative transitions signal a contrast 
or departure from the previous text. Casual transitions describe cause and effect. Sequential transitions indicate a sequence. Some examples of transition words in regards to their action or relation in a sentence are provided. So if you're going to be talking about an addition to something, in addition, Miller is a good dog because he knows how to sit. So you could, I could start that as well as not having please. Miller is a good dog because he can sit. An illustration, uh, transition words. In this case, Miller is a good dog because he doesn't get fleas. Cause and effect. Because Miller doesn't get fleas, he is a good dog. Comparison. Bad dogs get fleas, but Miller is a good dog because he doesn't get fleas. It goes on to describe words that could be included if you're contrasting something, if you want to emphasize something, if you want to talk about time and sequence, or I think the last one is directional. So yeah, these lists are just helpful little phrases that you can include in your sentences to let your reader know what idea you're trying to express, express clearly, whether it be a comparison, a direction, some time, or you're adding something on, you get the idea. Another tip is if you want to point back to a concept that was included in a previous sentence, then in this instance, you would want to use pointing words. Uh, commonly used pointing words include these, this, that, there, and such. Gender pronouns are also included in this group of helpers. Uh, another tip for stating yourself clearly or defining your concept is uh, using statements and phrases, particularly key phrases. Key phrases and statements, as well as their antonyms and synonyms repeated throughout your text, help readers get a better sense of your topic. The best parts of, of these words is you get the ones you use are up to you. However, being tasteful and mindful in repetition is suggested. So you don't want to use the same key phrase or word over and over again um, because, yeah, it's a bit like techno, techno and writing. And the repetition can get really uh, agitating to your readers and then they get bored and then they wander off and go do something else besides try to understand what you're saying to them. One other uh, tip might be to think about is um, if you're not sure if a sentence sounds right or if it's making sense or whatever, um, I like to read them out loud to myself. And then if I'm still a bit on the fence of whether or not it makes sense, I'll run it by a family member or a friend um, even if they're bored by it, don't care. I just want to see if it might make sense to someone else other than me. And if someone else goes, what are you talking about? That means I need to get back to the writing board. Uh, having an extra person to look over your work never hurts when um, doing essays or research papers. I frequently have someone like a close personal enemy who will tell me the brutal truth, read over mine or listen to me read it out loud. And uh, then they'll point out where I've kind of gone off subject or just not making sense. Essentially, words in an essay or the sentences are like bridges. Each piece needs to connect to get you from the beginning to the middle to the end. And, you know, people could argue that essay and research paper writing also makes you want to jump off bridges. It can be difficult, but I know you all can do it. And with practice, we're all going to get better. Happy writing. Bye. 
Hi, I'm Anita Exner and will be presenting the following topic. Academic writing doesn't mean setting aside your own voice. From the book They Say, I Say, page 139. The goal of this chapter or of this topic is to counteract this common misconception that relying in college on a straightforward, down-to-earth language you use every day will make you sound stupid, that to impress your teachers you need to set aside your everyday voice and write in a way that is hard to understand. But isn't good writing complicated? Academic writing doesn't mean setting aside your own voice. The following excerpt is from page 140 from the book They Say, I Say. Mastering academic writing does not mean completely abandoning your normal voice for one that is stiff, convoluted, and pompous, as a student often assume. Instead, it means creating a new voice that draws on the voice you already have. This does not mean any language you use among your friends or family has a place in academic writing. It also does not mean that you may fall back on your everyday voice as an excuse to remain in your comfort zone. And furthermore, it does not mean to avoid learning the rigorous forms and habits that characterize ac academic culture. Academic writing is often at its best when it combines what we call everyday speak and academic speak. Learning academic and colloquial styles. There are numerous benefits to blending colloquial, also known as everyday speak, and academic styles. For example, it can often make complicated topics easier for you to digest or understand. It is often a great way when trying to discover what you want to say. It helps us to remind, it helps to remind us of our audience. What do they already know and what do they not know? Self-translation the process of clarifying your own complex ideas. The following video from YouTube shows how African American language has developed and shows great examples. It will only, I will only play about one and a half minutes of the video. Feel free to watch a full video in your free time. It is quite interesting. Bay squad, fleek, basic, no cap, bet, yes, turn up, spilling tea, got receipts, keep it a hundred, finesse. These are just a few terms and phrases that originated in black communities and have become popularized, some might say co-opted, by mainstream American culture. But this trend predates the internet by decades. Americans have long embraced contributions to popular language from African Americans arguably more than they've been willing to embrace the people themselves. This cultural dissonance is just one part of the long, complicated history of African-American English. And to unpack it, I'm joined by sociolinguist and AAE researcher, Dr. Rick Bay Squaw. A translation recipe. Translating academic speak to everyday speak can help you not only demystify challenging material, but also reinterpret it, showing that you understand it by putting it into your own words. A simple recipe for mixing styles that encourage you to try out in your own writing. State the point in academic language and then translate it into everyday language. For example, scholar X argues XYZ. In other words, XYZ. Instead of in other words, you can also use essentially X argues XYZ, or plainly put it, XYZ. Translating academic speak to everyday speak can help you understand the topic better. Self-translation can also assist in clarifying your own complex ideas. Everyday language as a thinking tool. Translating academic speak into everyday speak can function, can function as a thinking tool, clarifies ideas, and underscores ideas. In other words, translating academic speak into everyday speak enables you to discover what you're trying to say. Everyday, well, everyday speak is often crucial in that it translates your own ideas into more common, simple terms which can help you figure out what your ideas are really about, as opposed to what you initially imagined they were. A major benefit of write, writing collaboratively is that it repeatedly forces us to explain it in simpler terms 
are less than clear ideas when one of us doesn't already know what the other means. Code mashing. Code mashing, code mashing is the act of combining local, vernacular, colloquial words, world dialects of English with standard written English on formal assignments and in everyday conversation in an attempt to embrace the globalized and diverse world we live in. What if everyday language is filled with slang? What if your everyday language is an, is an ethnic or regional dialect or a different language? Can such language be incorporated in academic, professional, or public writing? To answer these following questions is yes and no. There are many situations, for example, when you apply for a job or submit a proposal to be read by someone important where everyday speak or slangs are not appropriate. In such instances, it is safer to write in standardized English. Whereas the line between language and that might confuse audiences and language that engages or challenges them is not always obvious, nor is the lines between foreign words that readers don't already know and those that readers might happily learn. From my own experience, English is my second language, and I choose to translate it academic speak to everyday speak very often, as it does help us or help me to understand the material better. It further also helps broaden your vocabulary as you will learn new words along the way. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and thank you for listening. Avoiding plagiarism. Plagiarism. What is plagiarism? Plagiarism is academic dishonesty in your work. Using someone else's words without their knowledge could be a picture, ideas, text, or data. Types of plagiarism. There are many types of plagiarism. Direct plagiarism copying a text word for word, self-plagiarism, reusing someone else's work without their disclosure, mosaic plagiarism, mixing copied phrases with your own words without citation, and accidental plagiarism, not citing sources correctly, often done unintentionally. How to avoid plagiarism. The most common form of plagiarism is mosaic plagiarism, or in other words, paraphrasing a text We'll look at someone else's work and just change the words into our own stuff and turn it in as if it was our own work. Like, we created it. Nobody else came up with the idea. I never found it on Google. I was never told about it. I just made it my own work. The ways we can avoid plagiarism and get fully credited for our work is by using our own words while preserving the original text. Quoting one's work. Use direct quotes for the wording and always cite your source. Don't forget to cite your source. Summarizing, condensing the major parts from the source and citing it. Using proper citation and being sure to always provide proper citation in the requested format. Meaning if you ask to write a paper, if it's MLA or APA style. The consequences of plagiarism, this all depends on where the plagiarism occurred, meaning if it was school, if it was work, if it was outside of those lives, outside of work, outside of school, just in your daily life. For example, for school, if you were to be caught, it would be you could fill the class, get an F for that assignment get kicked out the class, get told on to the dean, get kicked out the school, um, get suspended, and this could possibly hurt you in the future. Your, um, what is that word? It'll hurt you in the future. It'll hurt you in general to where um, it's like it stays attached to, for example, if you decide to go to a different school because of this, that other school will find out because it, it is in your records. So most schools will just have it travel along with you. Just attached. Like, you won't see it, but it's in there. Like, oh, this child got caught, you know, plagiarizing. Or this person got caught plagiarizing. So that's why they got kicked out of school. Um, at work, you can get fired, written up. Um, again, 
hurt you in the long run to where you go apply for a different job and somewhere somehow they find out you got fired or kicked out this job because you got caught plagiarizing and in just daily lives you could possibly get arrested they'll consider it as fraud so you'll get arrested and end up doing time or paying a fine or however it is or to what extent it is in conclusion in all just try to avoid plagiarism <laughs> start your work ahead of time do research on the topic that is given to you or whatever the subject may be like set a time aside to fully research it if you have to google it if you have to find books to read on it whatever it is you have to do to get the work done to make sure this is your own work that even if you did look at someone else's work you were able to attach them to your assignment saying that such and such was the one who did this article and this is where I got some of my sources from if it's quotes uh, this quote came from such and such like it's good to cover your behind in this case cover your behind so get a head start study understand the material that is given to you and prepare your work that way you are able to just go ahead and write it no having to find it spin it do whatever it is turn it into your own words that we are good to go Hello, I'm Ava Jackson, and I'm with Group 4. Um, I had the art of meta-commentary. What is meta-commentary? Meta-commentary is your way of communicating things on your claims and telling others how you, how you think and how you don't think about them. Statements such as, what I mean was, or my point is, can also be, uh, meta-commentary can also be used to clarify things. So say you're giving an example and someone doesn't understand you. When you're clarifying what you mean, that's meta-commentary. People do it in their everyday lifestyle, everyday conversation. You don't even realize that you're doing it. Also, meta-commentary is used to elaborate things by in, like getting your point across. When you're in an argument with some somebody, you use this a lot um, using statements such as, what I said, like what I mean, or no, I didn't mean that, or what I meant was, that's all meta commentary. An example is, um, say you have steak and potatoes. I love steak, but I don't really like potatoes. But don't get me wrong, I don't love all meats. The statement, but don't get me wrong, that's what makes it meta commentary. Um, the original meta commentary are book titles. It tells you what it is without giving you full detail. So a book title such as The Cat in the Hat would be meta commentary. Or a book title such as To Kill a Mockingbird, you find out why the book is that title later on. It, it just gives you like a sneak peek, I could say. So meta commentary, like I said in previous slides, it is clarifying and elaborating using words such as essentially or but rather or this is not to say in your statement that's all makes it a clarifying statement which makes it meta commentary also elaborating when you elaborate your point you're using words in other words or what ifs or what if that or and in another way that's all used for meta commentary so that's my part of the slide. Um.